Oh, slow my come everybody. Ooh, a little little light glare, but that's okay. We'll survive. Try to blur my background. Yeah, it doesn't really help, but that's okay. All right. Um, so like them, everybody. Welcome back to our Friday Jumma service. We want to begin in the name of Allah. Praise belongs to Allah. We praise him and we ask him for guidance and for forgiveness. We seek protection in Allah from the malice of our own souls and the evil of our actions. Whom Allah guides, no one can lead them astray. And whom he lead, makes astray, no one can lead them back to the right path. I bear witness that there is no deity but Allah alone with no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad is the servant and messenger of Allah. You who believe, be mindful of God as is his due and make sure you devote yourselves to him to your dying moment. Believers, be mindful of God's speak in a direct fashion and to good purpose. And he will put your deeds right for you and forgive you your sins. Whoever obeys God and his messenger will truly achieve a great triumph. So again, as alaikum, my dear sisters and brothers, and I am grateful to Allah that we are able to share company together again on this blessed Friday. Um, and what a Friday, uh, the, the last Friday of Ramadan. We have just a few days left of Ramadan, and tonight is the 27th night, I believe, of, of uh, Ramadan. And, and as you all know, tonight, um, the 27th is often attributed to being um, or believed to be the, the night of power, Laylatul Qadr. Uh, I'm not going to go into the significance of this night, uh, but it does serve as a reminder that the month is coming to a close. Uh, this is the time where we start to reflect on what we accomplished during Ramadan, what lessons we learned, and, and how the month has gone and how we have engaged with it, and, and hopefully how it's changed us for the good. Um, and of course, this is considered one of the best times to make prayers and dua. So, But today, um, I want to continue where I left off last time. Um, last time I offered a Friday reflection with the story of Moses from Musa alayhi salam. So, and I'm as, just to warn you, I'm going to use the name Musa, Musa and Moses interchangeably because of the various uh, translations and references I've sourced. Um, so, so last time we had just gotten into the story and how he, um, and it's, so today we'll continue the journey uh, of Musa with the Quran. And as you recall, Musa was born uh, in very troubling times in Egypt. His community, the people of Israel, uh, were being persecuted by the powers of Egypt, ruled by Pharaoh. Uh, we left off the point of the story when infant Musa is reunited with his mother. And what happens from here until Musa reaches adult adulthood is not very well known with regards to what is contained in the Quran and from the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. But the first 45 verses, verses of Surat al-Qasas uh, tells us about the life of Musa or an extensive part of the life of Musa, especially the beginning. And we ended previously on verse 13. So verse 13 says, we restored him to his mother in this way so that she might be comforted, not grieve and know that God's promise is true, though most of them do not know. And so today we're gonna to continue um, from there with verse 14. And so it jumps from the reunification to, quote, when Moses reached full maturity and manhood, we gave him wisdom and knowledge. This is how we reward those who do good. Um, and, and so we discover in the story of, Mus of Moses that he was a very forthright man. He believed in speaking his mind and standing up for the weaker members of society. Whenever he witnessed oppression or cruelty, he found it impossible to stop himself from intervening. Uh, this is quite fascinating because it makes one wonder, when did Musa come to understand the evil and injustice of Pharaoh? He must have always known he was not an Egyptian. You remember, he grew up, we believe, we, we, we've come to understand that he grew up in the palace, being raised by Pharaoh and Pharaoh's wife. But he knew that he was an Egyptian and from, therefore, the weaker segment of society. Yet despite living among the ruling elite, he had a deep sense of justice and fairness. Uh, and Muhammad Asad remarks that this verse is almost entirely identical to uh, verse 22 of chapter 12. And there it refers to Yusuf. But it stresses the supreme divine blessing of spiritual consciousness combined with rational thought, the ability to judge between right and wrong. And we can assume that uh, only with this blessing could Musa understand uh, how to differentiate between right and wrong, between good and evil, and how to separate those. So the, sur the surah goes on to reveal, and one day he entered the city at a time when most of its people were resting in their homes, unaware of what was going on in the streets. And there he encountered two men fighting with one another, one of his own people, the other of his enemies. 
And the one who belonged to his own people cried out to him for help against uh, the one against him who was of his enemies. Whereupon Musa, Musa, uh, Moses struck him down with his fist, and thus brought about his end. But then he said to himself, "This is of Satan's doing. Verily, he is an open foe, leading people astray." He said, "My Lord, I have wronged myself. Forgive me." So he forgave him. He is truly the most forgiving, the merciful. He said, my Lord, because of the blessings you have bestowed upon me, I shall never support those who do evil. Okay, so that is verses uh, 15, 16, and 17 from the 28th chapter. And so let's dig into these verses just a little bit. Uh, Ibn Kathir narrates that one day, while walking in the city, Moses comes upon two people fighting, two men fighting. One was an Israelite and the other Egyptian. The Israelite recognized uh, Moses and cried out uh, to him for help. Moses stepped back, uh, sorry, stepped into the fight and struck the Egyptian with one ferocious blow. He immediately fell to the ground and died. Moses was overcome with grief. He was aware of his own strength, but did not imagine that he had the power to kill someone with one blow. Now, according to Muhammad Asid, the reference of Satan's doing, verses uh, 16 and 17, seemed to indicate that it was the Israelite and not the Egyptian who had uh, been in the wrong. Moses had come to the assistance of the Israelite out of the instinctive sense of racial kinship without regard to the rights and wrongs of the case. But immediately afterwards, he realized that he had committed a grave sin, not only by killing, however inadvertently, an innocent person, but also by basing his actions on a mere tribal, or as what we would describe today, racial or national prejudice. Uh, evidently, this is the purport of the above Quranic segment of the story of Moses. So this is what Muhammad Asad is saying, is that um, it was it was to default to tribal allegiance um, instead of what is just. Uh, that is the moral essence of these verses. Um, and uh, this, this moral has been stressed and explained by the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, on many occasions, including this hadith. He is not of us who proclaims the cause of tribal partisanship, and he is not of us who fights in the cause of tribal partisanship. He is not of us who dies in the cause of tribal partisanship. And when the Prophet was asked to explain the meaning of tribal partisanship, the Prophet answered, it means helping your own people in an unjust cause. So there's a lot to think about, but inshallah, I'll touch a little bit more on this on the, on the second part of the khutbah. But let's return to where we left off, okay? So let's pick up at verse 18. The next morning, he was walking in the city, fearful and vigilant, when suddenly a, the man who had helped the day before cried out to him for help, who, this may have been a mistype, but suddenly the man who he, he, he had helped the day before cried out to him for help. Moses said, you are clearly a troublemaker. And he was about to attack the man who was an enemy to both of them. The man said, Moses, are you going to kill me as you killed that person yesterday? You, you clearly want to be a tyrant in the land. You do not intend to put things right. Then a man came running from the furthest part of the city and said, Moses, the authorities are talking about killing you. So leave, this is my sincere advice. So Moses left the city fearful and wary and prayed, my Lord, save me from people who do wrong. So again, that's for, those are verses 20, uh, 28, 18 to 21. So these verses read fairly straightforward, you know, with some deep and some details can be found in various tafsir and exegesis. Um, so either be because the streets were relatively deserted or because the people had no wish to be involved in a serious assault, the authorities had no idea that Moses was involved in that, in that melee the day before. But the next day, when Moses saw that same Israelite man involved in yet another fight, he started to suspect that that man was a troublemaker and approached him to warn him about that behavior. The Israelite saw Moses striding towards him and became afraid. He called out, would you kill me as you killed that wretch yesterday? The man's opponent, an Egyptian, heard this remark and rushed away to report Moses to the authorities. Uh, later on that day, Moses was approached by a person unknown who informed him that the authorities were planning to arrest him and possibly put him to death for the crime of killing an Egyptian. So what happens to Moses? Moses uh, immediately leaves the confines of the city. He did not take the time to return to his home, change his clothes, prepare provisions, right? He, just, he left as he was. And, and we know from certain teachings that Moses and Musa 
strode into the desert towards uh, Midian, a country that lay between Syria and Egypt. Uh, his heart was filled with fear, and he was afraid that he would turn around and see the authorities pursuing him. He walked and walked, and when his feet and legs felt like lead, he continued walking. His shoes wore away on the rough desert ground, and the hot sand burned the soles of his feet. Moses was exhausted, hungry, thirsty, and bleeding. But he forced himself to continue, some say for more than a week, until he came to a watering hole. And Moses threw himself under the shade of the tree. Death in the dry, dusty heat of the Egyptian desert should have been the likely outcome of Moses' journey. Uh, tracking across the inhospitable landscape with no provisions and inappropriate clothing would have been an expedition doomed to failure. Yet once again, the story of Moses reveals a fundamental truth. If a believer submits to the will of God, God will provide for him, uh, provide him from resources unimaginable. God will replace weakness with strength and replace failure for victory. And these are lessons that all of us um, can take to heart. So Moses arrives safely in the desert oasis. And um, there's a, you know, it's a watering hole. And we'll, we'll continue, inshallah, the next time I join you. We'll pick up the story from, from here, but at this point, we're going to stop the Moses' story for, for this portion. Um, I say this saying of mine, I say this saying of mine, and I seek forgiveness from Allah for me and for you and for the rest of the Muslims. So ask him for forgiveness. He is the forgiver, the merciful. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wassalatu wassalam ala rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the name of God, uh, the name of Allah and exaltations be to Allah. Blessings of, and peace be upon the messenger of Allah. So going back to the story of Moses and how is this relevant in, in our lives today? What lessons can we take away uh, from these verses that are in the Quran? And I want to spend a, a few moments just focusing on the relevance of verses 15 through 17 and specifically Muhammad Asad's exegesis on those verses. You know, he puts a heavy emphasis on the dangers of tribal partisanship and that it goes against the moral code of the Quran. And when we think about that, you know, we can conclude that blind allegiances can lead a person or a people for that matter towards a path of immorality, of injustice and oppression. So again, it's, you know, think about it, thinking about it in today, you know, as you probably like you, me, Gaza has been on my mind night and day for the past six months. And I, I try to find answers Right? I try to find meaning in what we're seeing in the news, what we're hearing from people on the ground, and, and how can I turn to Islam and turn to the Quran or turn to Allah and find logic and reason and understanding, because it can be a bit overwhelming. And so how can we look at these few verses and find relevance to what's going on in, in Gaza, for instance? For instance, we'll use Gaza as an example, but of course this can be applicable to so many other situations. So you know, initially what comes to mind when I'm reading this portion of Musa's story was that tribal partisanship and that unwavering support and how we see it towards Israel, right? Especially from so many in the Western world, despite the swaths of devastation and destruction that are in our faces, you know, we look and we just see this support and money being poured in and justification for what uh, Israel is doing to the Palestinians. But if we only focus on the other side or the, the enemy, to draw compromises to them and Musa's actions, are we are we really grasping what Allah is telling us, right? So, because you know, if we're reading it, we should also be looking at ourselves and we can't just assume that we're on the right cause and doing everything right. So for those who uh, support the Palestinian cause, can you know we can fall prey to the ills of, of tribal partisanship. And the goal is peace, right? So how can we work towards peace, towards justice? towards reconciliation in such an unjust and imbalanced, caste divided society. You know, uh, what did Musa, despite having those divine gifts from Allah, what did he not employ in the heat of that moment? I, I would argue that what he was missing in that moment and what is often missing for many instances of conflict, including what is happening in Palestine and around, you know, how we're all viewing it, um, are two ingredients, and that is humanity and humility. So Musa did not, when he approached that situation, he did not see the humanity in the Egyptian when he struck him. He merely saw enemy, foe, adversary, injustice, oppressor. 
And for the Israelite, he didn't pause to assess the situation properly, right? He resorted to the, the instant connection of tribal members, one of his own, part of himself. And he missed an opportunity to seek humility in that moment. Maybe this isn't what it seems. So humanity in your enemy and humility in your own existence. This is what we must strive to uplift in moments of conflict. And I know it's not easy. It is far easier to see the situation as black and white, two distinct and opposing monoliths where one is wholly right and one is wholly wrong. Where the reality, but the, sorry, but the reality is people are diverse in so many ways. And that just because someone has a certain identity or label doesn't mean they automatically have all the attributes of either all that's good or all that's bad. For instance, let's look at Gaza. There are Israelis and Jews and even Zionists by some variety of definitions who recognize that what is happening to the Palestinians is wrong. Can we look past their identity and find the humanity in them, right? Can we be, can, you know, can that be a gateway to build a bridge? Because if we don't, what's going to happen, right? It is hard to see things in a nuanced way. It is hard to see things where a person or their viewpoint from only our perspective, from only our lived experience. Is there a way to see the humanity in them to fully try to understand what their experience has been and how they came to think the way that they think? And is there room for movement? Is there room for shifts, right? And so in order to find the humanity in others, we must first find the humility in ourselves. We cannot simply write off the humanity in our enemy and believe that it will bring about peace and justice. They're wrong. They have no chance. You know, they're the enemy. There's no point in working with them. There's no point in trying to pull them towards us or anything. Alternatively, what happens when we don't do that? Or, or think about what, it, wouldn't you want them to do that with us, right? Are we looking at ourselves and saying, what we're doing is the exact right way. It's the, it's the proper way. It's the, you know, we have no faults. This is the greatest way to do things. We stand, we, you know, we are the, the representatives of justice. We are um, in the right and they are in the wrong. Is there possibly, possibly a moment in any type of conflict where, where we might be, you know, we might be able to show some humility and say, you know, maybe, maybe there's a better way. Maybe there's a different way. Maybe I can give a little right? Maybe they can give a little, and then we can start to work towards each other. And if we don't do that, no, no peace will ever come. And so thinking about what Musa's immediate response was after striking that fatal blow to the Egyptian, right? Did he say, well, he was an enemy. You know, there's more, to, there's more where they came from. He says, this is of Satan's doing. Verily, he is an open foe leading people astray. Satan is the enemy of humility. He is the enemy of justice and peace. And we cannot let that type of enemy prevail even when we are situated in times of, of intense dire straits. So with that, I wanna remind us that we are approaching the end of Ramadan and um, there's no better time than to employ added humility in ourselves and to seek the humanity in others, even if they are our enemy, because that is the greatest way to keep Satan at bay. Um, so, so let's spend these last few blessed days and nights of Ramadan praying and striving to uphold what God has commanded uh, us for us to do and to fight what God has warned us about. Oh Allah, please accept our good deeds and our good intentions. Forgive us Forgive our shortcomings and missteps and allow us to experience many more moments together. O oh Allah, grant us the good, grant us the good things in this world and the good things in the next life, and save us from the punishment of the hellfire. O oh Allah, aid us in accepting the tests and tribulations of this life and give us the strength to overcome any challenges we may face. O oh Allah, rid us of our anxiety, our despair, our sorrow, and replace in us a sense of serenity and tranquility. O oh Allah, we ask you to place peace and solace in the hearts of those suffering injustices. O Allah, let the people of Gaza and Sudan and all of those suffering in the world know we are praying for them and we are using what little power we have to try and change their situation. O Allah, we hope for your mercy. Do not leave us to ourselves, even for the blinking of an eye. Correct our each of our affairs for us. There is none worthy of worship but you. And if I have said anything of truth, it is from Allah alone and my gratitude goes to Allah. And if I have said anything that was not of truth, 
And that is from my own ego. And I ask forgiveness uh, for that transgression. So um, that's it. That's my that's my khutbah. I thank you all for being here. Um, in terms of uh, announcements, um, this weekend we have the fourth and final installment of the Ramadan Helika. Um, that is tomorrow at one o'clock. That will be led by Dr. Hina Azam. And then Sunday we have two things. We got a back-to-back double header. We've got Quran reflections in the morning at 11 a.m. Central Time, and at uh, 2 p.m. we have the uh, meditation Murakba meditation led by Sister Narisha. Uh, and then if you are local to the Austin area, there are a few opportunities for you to get involved with um, with some events. We have book book story time tomorrow at Book People. And then there's a Zakat of Fitter distribution volunteer project on Monday and Tuesday. And then Eid, inshallah, will be on Wednesday. But I hope you're all doing well and um, enjoying this last few days of Ramadan. Assalamu alaikum.